A few weeks ago, Dave took you through the Mac Plus from the late 80s. Steve Jobs was not a person that liked hobbyist computing. He really wanted a smooth thing like this, preferably as impenetrable as possible. He never really liked the idea of upgrading things. Dave wasn't able to get the full version of Adobe Acrobat 1 running because the machine only has 2.5 megabytes of RAM. So what we're going to do today is take the machine to bits, have a look at the actual hardware inside this thing, and upgrade it to a full four megabytes of RAM. To make things harder, just as Apple still do today, it uses Torx screws to hold the thing together. So we're going to have to use a special Torx screwdriver. But to make things even harder, and I'm sorry, Babbage, you're in the way, some of the screws are buried right in the back here. So if your screwdriver is not long enough, you couldn't actually get them out. And so there used to be a lively trade back in the late 80s and early 90s for very long screwdrivers for removing these things. Now, I've already removed and lost one of the screws from here. So I've only got a few more to take out. So let me just get the relevant screwdriver and we'll get the uh, back off this thing. So there's two screws down here and another one over here. And then there's the hidden screw, as always, which is behind the battery door here. And I suspect, looking at the age of this battery, that that probably needs replacing as well. So we'll just get that out. So it's not a standard AA as I thought it was when I pulled it out. It's a 4.5 volt battery made in the USA. I'm sure if I looked online, I'd find a replacement. So we've now unscrewed the machine and we can slide it apart. And the way I think it works is we slide the front out from the back. There we go. And if we slide the front out, we can start to see how it is to the inside. So it's a CRT based monitor, so you can see the tube at the back here. And you'll notice that I'm being very careful not to touch anything in this area because even though this machine's been off for a while, there's some huge capacitors in here and the voltages in here would probably throw me across the room if I wasn't careful. So this is a real, very real case of don't try this at home, is it? Yeah, please don't try this at home unless you're willing to die. But perhaps an interesting place to start is actually in the back of the case itself. It looks, at first glance, quite normal, but if we get the light in the right place, we can start to see that on the actual back, there are all the signatures of the people who are involved in making the actual original Macintosh. I think that's the great Steve Jobs' signature there, who I think, and there's various other people that we can see lying around. So that's the back of the case. Let's actually turn ourselves back to the actual machine, pop that out of the way for now. So we've got various things. This is the analog board and does the power. So we've got the mains power coming in here, generates the voltages for the CRT, and also provides power down here to the actual digital board here. There's also a connector for the floppy drive, which I'm going to remove there, standard IDC connector. Now this is where it gets slightly tricky in that I've got to release this connector here from the analog board to the digital board. This isn't any different really from a TV of the time, that in many respects, it generates the power, takes the signal off the motherboard, converts it and drives the CRT, the electron beam, floating around on here. The actual computer bit itself is buried on the digital board but here. So bear with me as I struggle to remove the digital board and then we can look at that in some detail. So I'm trying, without destroying everything, to remove the power cable. So I've got one screwdriver in that side and I'll get another one in this oh, side. Yeah. But there's a whole load of data traces the other side that I don't want to scrape off the motherboard otherwise it'll never work again and then Dave won't be a happy bunny. There we are. Aha! We've got that out now. Hopefully it'll go back in later. So we can now slide out the motherboard from the bottom and it comes out quite nicely. I should probably be wearing anti-static stuff while doing this but let's live dangerously. So this is the heart of the Mac Plus. And let's just take a, a second to look around what we've actually got on here. Most computers at the time had very similar things. Good place to start is at the centre. And this chip here, the Motorola 68000, is the CPU of the computer. It's not an IBM one, it's developed by a company called Motorola. It was a 16-bit chip, but it was also a 32-bit chip. 
and this is where it becomes difficult to know whether to call it a 16 or a 32-bit CPU. It's got a 16-bit data bus, but all its registers inside are 32 bits, and so it's sometimes referred to as both 16 and 32 bits, and there's long discussion on whether it should be referred to as a 16-bit or a 32-bit chip. Later versions in the family, the 68020, 68030, were full 32-bit chips with 32-bit data buses. A 16-bit data bus means every time it transfers something to the rest of the system, it can send 16 bits in one go. So if it needs to send 32 bits over to the rest of the system, it has to send the first 16 bits and then send the second 16 bits afterwards. What we've also got here is a clock chip, and this generates a 16 megahertz, roughly, or 15.667 megahertz signal that is used to synchronize everything together. So every time this beats, the CPU will do something else. What else have we got? Well, we've got two chips here. These are the ROM chips, and these are both 8-bit ROM chips, ROM high and ROM low, which contain the Macintosh operating system. So that's the Macintosh toolkit. It's not the full operating system because some of that's loaded in off disk, but it's enough to actually get things loaded in off disk and get things going. These are two 8-bit chips, but they're sort of used in parallel. So this one will provide one set of 8 bits, and this one will provide another set of 8 bits to form the 16 bits of the data bus. The other thing we've got, turning it around, so this is the RAM, two sets of SIMs here. Two of these will be 1 meg SIMs, the other ones will be 256K SIMs, giving us a total of 2.5 megabytes. But I have got here 4 meg of SIMs, so 4 1 megabyte SIMs. There's eight of these on here. Each one of these holds 1 megabits worth of data. They're arranged in parallel to get eight, and we use them in pairs on the motherboard to get our 16 bit wide memory. So let's just pop these SIMs out. These are not too dissimilar from DIMMs and so on we use in a modern PC, but rather than having two layers of connectors at the bottom, they just have a single set of connectors. So these are 30-pin SIMs, single inline memory modules, and along the bottom you can see we've got these silver connectors which will actually connect in to the motherboard. Eight of these connectors will carry the data bits, so it's got eight bit wide data bus on these things. A further 11 are the address bus. The others have got things like power and some of the address rows, whether it's a read or a write that we've got in there. So let's just pop all these out. You have to be careful with this because it's very easy, as I found as a teenager, to snap the connectors and then you have to sort of super glue the SIMs into these connections. This was really at the beginning of when SIMs were used in computers. If you look at other computers around from that time, they were less likely to use SIMs and we sometimes just had the RAM chips soldered directly onto the motherboard. We can just pop the new SIMs into it like so. I got these off eBay. It's still possible to get spares for old computers. There we are. And they just clip in and so on. I don't know if you can get a close-up, but if you look, there is sort of teeth-like things which when these slide in, make the electrical connection to the memory. So that should now have four megabytes worth of memory as opposed to the 2.5 megabytes that we had before. Not much bigger than the average motherboard these days. The actual connections are a lot bigger and so you can start to see how things connect together. And in fact, if you can just get a close up, you can start to see all the wires connecting things together here. And if we look on the back, see if we can find all 16 together. Start to see it here. You can see all the address buses and data buses connecting. So you're gonna hoover it while you got it out? So we've just got to reassemble this and um, put it back together and hopefully it'll uh, turn on and have four megs of memory. Slides back in, there's two runners underneath somewhere that it sort of clips into. There we are. There we are, and that looks nicely back together. I'll plug the hard disk in, plug the keyboard and mouse in, and we can see if it's upgraded. So the SCSI with the hard disk plugs in here, and we've also got connections on the back here for the mouse, so we'll plug that in. You can turn that around, plug in power to the two things, plug the keyboard to the front, and the moment of truth. So it seems to be taking slightly longer to boot at the moment. I suspect that's because it's checking the memory and of course it's now almost double the amount of memory we had before, four meg rather than 2.5. So I have to wait for it to boot. Now it's booted, we can go into the About This Mac or About The Finder and you can see it's got four meg of RAM as opposed to the two and a half we had before. 
So the machine still seems to be working, and now with 4 meg, and hopefully Dave will be able to upgrade his version of Acrobat. We reduce what we refer to as the feature size of the component, so we reduce the size of the transistor and the wire, and of course if we have the dimension of it, then because it's a flat surface, we quadruple, multiply by four the number of components. Now you said 80 basic computer, kind of late 1970s, early 80s style, uh, but it's been knocked up on a breadboard for a bit of fun.